All right, maybe I'm, I'll just introduce you and then we can, we can start the session here. Um, first of all, I just wanna say um, uh, thank you to, to Dr. George Yancey. Dr. George Yancey is the Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Philosophy at Emory University and a Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth College, one of the college's highest honors. He is also the University of Pennsylvania's inaugural fellow in the Provost Distinguished Faculty Fellowship Program during the 2019-2020 academic year. He works primarily in the areas of critical philosophy of race, critical whiteness studies, critical phenomenology, especially on racial embodiment and philosophy of the black experience. Yancey is the author, editor, and co-editor of over 20 books. He is cited as one of the top 10 influential philosophers in the last 10 years from 2010 to 2020 based upon the number of citations and web presence. He has also published over 170 combined scholarly articles, chapters, and interviews that have appeared in professional journals, books, and at various news sites. For example, he is well known for his influential essays and interviews at the New York Times philosophy column, The Stone, and at the prominent political website, Truth Out. He is also the series editor of Philosophy of Race at Lexington Books. And I would just like to add, um, our conference here is on the experience of the stranger. And um, just a little story, Alfred Schutz, as all of you may, many of you may know, um, served in World War I for Austria. And when he came back, because he was Jewish, um, he was told to leave Austria and never return again, which he felt was just a, he had been converted into a stranger in his own culture in a way. And it strikes me that many of the uh, African-American men who served in World War II came back and experienced discrimination and had a, a, a terrible discrimination as a fact with, with, many of the, with the Jim Crow laws in effect. And they experienced the same kind of thing Schutz did. I think they experienced being made strangers in their own culture, the culture for which they had, they had just risked their lives in a sense. And so I think it's highly appropriate that we, we, we consider this whole issue of race in connection with people being made strangers in their own culture by oppressive forces. And so with uh, no further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yancey. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that, um, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, that's a really nice, um, thank you for the introduction, but a really nice segue too. I was, I was trying to find my voice here and wondering what it is here at this conference, but you, I think you just set it up re really well. I appreciate that. Um, so as I was asked to provide the keynote for the, for the Schutz um, circle, I was initially hesitant, and I'm, by the way, I'm just reading, reading from my paper. I don't have any, any fancy uh, slides or anything, so, but I'll occasionally look up. Um, but as I was asked to provide the keynote for the Schutz circle, I was initially hesitant to do so uh, because I'm in no way uh, a specialist uh, in the work of Alfred Schutz. However, this occasion did remind me of my time at Yale University, where I actually took a graduate seminar on Schutz, uh, which was taught by the late uh, philosopher Maurice Natanson. As I recall, I wrote a paper using Schutz to critique uh, behaviorism when that was hugely popular. Um, however, I was still hesitant until I looked over some of the other presentations, and especially after thinking about the generative conceptual range implied by the title, the experience of the stranger, the struggle to find a home, and the struggle to welcome the stranger. After the title, I was sold. Uh, so my talk uh, is called The Danger of White Innocence. Uh, I'll first argue that whiteness is what I call the transcendental norm, which marks racial strangeness vis-a-vis -vis the familiar as whiteness. Second, I describe whiteness as a structural binary or as structurally binary, hegemonic and hierarchical. Uh, I will then provide one vignette. I had three, but I thought, okay, just one vignette. Uh, which has famously come to be called the elevator effect, that will help to flesh out, actually give flesh to uh, whiteness as the transcendental norm and how the racialized stranger, in this case, black people or the black body, undergoes what Lewis Gordon importantly calls, quote, perverse forms of anonymity, end quote. And as I'll call perverse forms of racialized, and I'm going to say typification. I know some say typification, typ typification. I will suggest that these two forms of perversity are fundamentally linked to whiteness. As I describe the vignette, I would like for you to think about a counterintuitive understanding of the stranger. Now, if you look up the etymology of stranger, you get something like the strange, something like strange 
where strange implies the unknown or the unfamiliar. Stranger also implies that which is extraneous, which means of external origin. What I find intriguing is that as the black body or as a black person, I am not unknown or unfamiliar, but apparently well-known vis-a-vis whiteness. So it's not clear that I'm a stranger, quote unquote, but I am always already known. And yet how I am known is not me. So it is through an epistemic closure, the white gaze or the white imaginary, that I am a stranger, the one who is unpredictable in his predictability. As Gordon states correctly, quote, Fanon is concerned with forms of anonymity that constitute forms of closure, end quote. So it is that closure that interests me. Perhaps my being a stranger, qua unknown or unfamiliar, is what is necessary for whiteness uh, to self-empty. Perhaps it is my being unknown or my being unfamiliar that whiteness resists for its own existence. Because after all, what it knows about me is linked to what it knows about itself, but also refuses to know about itself. So to resist perverse anonymity will require more from white people. Perhaps who and what I am is lodged in my strangeness, in my not being known, my being unfamiliar. And perhaps it is whiteness that should concede its strangeness, right? It's not being known to itself. Perhaps this will lead to an unsuturing of whiteness whereby I am no longer the thought of the other, but the other of thought, as Edward Glisson would say. Being the thought of the other leaves me too familiar. Being the other of thought allows me to tarry in my strangeness, though not the strangeness of being trapped within the white imago. When I catch a glimpse of myself as a stranger, as whiteness sees me, it is then that I truly am extraneous to myself. I am of external origins. I am the refuse, the ejecta that whiteness has created. So first, uh, what is whiteness as the transcendental norm? By transcendental, I mean that I, I don't mean what Kant had in mind regarding space and time, namely that space and time are forms um, of forms, uh, formal features rather, of how we perceive objects, and that these formal features are universal and necessary. Whiteness is neither necessary nor universal. Rather, it is contingent and global. In a society where whiteness is the transcendental norm, it goes unmarked, unnamed, and unraced, or as critical theorist, a critical race theorist Patricia Williams says, that whiteness is the great ex-nominated, Whereas those who are not white are marked or named or named or raced. In other words, they are in this case rendered the stranger. They're deemed different or deviant. To be white is to be deemed persons as such or humans qua humans. Second, whiteness as a binary structure. Early critical whiteness studies, Ruth Frankenberg, when asked the question, what is whiteness? would say that white people generally will argue that whiteness is not that. And she'd say, what we'd have to ask, what is the that? Well, that is the non-white. So the question becomes, nonetheless, what is the content of whiteness? And then she again argues that when whites refer to their whiteness, they constitute themselves, themselves through negation by literally sort of ostensibly pointing, I am not that. Let's say, I am not that stranger. Uh, literary figure Toni Morrison, in a, her very uh, popular book entitled Playing in the Dark, explains this binary structure in terms of what she calls Africanism. She writes, quote, Africanism is the vehicle by which the American self knows itself as not enslaved, but free, not repulsive, but desirable, not helpless, but licensed and powerful, not history-less, but historical, not damned, but innocent, not a blind accident of evolution, but a progressive fulfillment of destiny, end quote. In fact, I might, you might say that for Toni Morrison, Africanism is sort of this process where the white self doesn't become the stranger. It knows itself precisely because it isn't strange. The deeper point here is that whiteness needs the black body as the stranger for its own existence, which implies that the concept of home, home, 
is linked to the homelessness of the black body. Third, whiteness is hegemonic. Now here, I simply mean that whiteness is a site of domination. Uh, think here in terms of racial capitalism, white privilege uh, as a species of authority, or think here of coloniality. Fourth, what is whiteness as the hierarchical structure? Well, whiteness here is at the apex of civilization or deemed to be so. Whiteness brings light, it brings truth, it brings reason, it brings logos, it is virtue. And you just pick your name, thinkers, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, Hegel, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Johannes Blumenbach, Carl von Linnaeus, Christoph Miners, George, Lee, uh, George Louis, Louis Leclerc, uh, Charles White, Samuel Morton, and others, they will have argued that whiteness is special. It denotes the quintessence of the anthropos, of the human. Now, before I walk us through the elevator effect, uh, this, this vignette that I have, I think it's necessary to provide a framework for how, I, for how I personally understand what it means to be at home and Black in North America. And I appreciate Michael for precisely uh, mentioning uh, Schutz's Jewish, uh, Jewish identity and what that meant for him. Especially as the concept of home features so significantly in the title of this conference. So when I think of home, I think of hospitality, openness, generosity. It is a place where one moves with effortless grace when Fanon refers to coming live in the, word, in the world, which is a beautiful term. And yet I find that my blackness is this place uh, called home is in fact a problem. That is to say, I am perceived as a problem, not contingently, but ontologically a problem in my own home, this home called white America. So it seems to me that if we are to take seriously the issues that are being raised and have been raised at the conference, at this conference, I just wanna set down a framework. I argue that Parisia, P-A-R-R-H-E-S-I-A, -E Parisia or fearless or courageous speech is so important when discussing issues regarding the figure of the stranger and questions of home and their relationship. Michel Foucault says that, quote, Parisia then is linked to courage in the face of danger, it demands the courage to speak the truth in spite of some danger, end quote. But along with courageous speech, we need courageous listening, which I see as an openness to have one's assumption shattered, to have one's self fissured, to have one's sense of ethical, epistemological, phenomenological, embodied, and affective certainty called into question, to have one's self touched to the point of vertigo and perhaps even crisis. Part of courageous speech in philosophy is to be a troublemaker, a contemporary gadfly. Being a troublemaker involves risk. As for academics, by troublemaker, I don't mean, assuming of course that we're all academics here, I don't mean being clever or showing us how good you are at refuting the arguments of your colleagues. It seems to me that so much more is at stake if we're talking about the question of the stranger and the question of home or homelessness. Given the international scope of this conference, some of you may or may not know Theo Shaw as one of the Jenna Six. The Jenna Six were six black teenagers in Jenna, Louisiana, who were convicted, um, who were convicted in, the 2000s, in 2006 for the beating of Justin Barker, a white student at the local Jenna High School. Many believed, given the complexity of the case, that their convictions were too severe and racially motivated. Well, Relatively recently, Theo Shaw, one of the members, wrote to me and asked a very difficult question. He asked, Dr. Yancey, is to be black and male in America like being on death row? So that's a very powerful question. You should know that Theo Shaw is now, has become a lawyer and is doing incredibly well. In fact, working precisely on the issues of race and questions of rights. On the one hand, when he posed that question, I didn't want to taint or potentially muddy his aspirations. On the other hand, I didn't want him to ever forget that to white America, he is not just a stranger, but a stranger embodied as the nigger. Now, that's a term that I'm going to use throughout. Um, there's a few um, racist uh, vitriolic comments that were sent to me after I wrote an article named uh, entitled Dear White America. 
Uh, I've decided to clean that up a bit. Oh, the language is rough, but the N word will continue to come out. So I'll forgive me for those who might be offended by that term, but I get to use the term here. Uh, du Bois, W.E. Du Bois, in a speech that he delivered in Peking, China at the age of 91, sums up an important message that all too familiarly speaks to black life in North America as home. Du Bois said, quote, in my country for nearly a century, for nearly a century, he says, I have been nothing but a nigger. I felt the need to tell the truth. So my answer to Theo Shaw was, is clear, meaning it is clear today. Why not? Given white America's history, vis-a-vis -vis the black body, why not? So yes, being black is like being on death row in this place called home. Some of you may also know that I wrote in 2015 a very controversial letter called Dear White America, which generated over thousands of comments at the Stone, the New York Times. For that piece, I received tons of hate mail, really vitriolic white supremacist responses in my university inbox, my voicemail, even snail mail. I even received postcards. So in some cases, white people would actually write to me, uh, write these letters, take them to the post office, put a stamp on the envelope just to call me a nigger in writing. And so I want you to think about what does that term mean? What does that process of interpolation means when it comes to my identity as a stranger or as someone who doesn't want to be a stranger and want to feel at home, but can't precisely because of the white racist vitriol here? Yet America is my home. And as some of you might also know, police presence was necessary during some of my public talks. I was told that the FBI got involved. White supremacist websites discussed the letter, and I was invited to appear on Fox News and other social media outlets, all of which I had decided, all of which I decided to decline. So I'm going to share with you a few of those responses that I received from white readers. And as you listen to them, I hope that you grasp a sense of the existentially and affectively dangerous work that is at stake when it comes to a critically engaging questions about one's own status in one's own house or in one's own home, where that home is a place of anti-blackness and whiteness. And as you listen, keep in mind that I refer to my letter in 2015, Dear White America, as a letter of love. So again, I've cleaned some of these up, but you'll still hear the, the weight of the vitriol. So here are two voice messages that were sent to me. And again, I want, since the, the topic is about home, and again, about what it means to be a stranger, what it means to find a place in a home, I think it's important that we discuss this in a very, it, to, to discuss this parisiastically. That's what I'm sort of arguing here. So first quote, or first vitriolic message. Quote, dear nigger professor, you are destroying the youth of this country. You are neither African nor American. You are pure 100% nigger. You would never, never marry outside of your nigger race. That's a fact. You're a smug nigger. You are uneducated with education. You are an animal, just like all black people in the United States of America, including that nigger Kenyan that was born in Kenya that has usurped the White House. Yes, it is called the White House because it's called the White House for a reason, because white people made this country great. You nigger, end quote. Quote, hey, Georgie boy, you're the racist. You wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for affirmative action. Somebody needs to put a boot up your rear end and knock your head off your shoulders. You stupid racist nigger. Inbox messages. Quote, Professor Yancey, all your studies have forced me to examine my self-image and my white racist mind, you clearly state that no matter what I think, I'm a racist. Okay, cool. Thank you for clearing that up. Now I am forced to say, because you tell me I can say nothing else, who cares about you, you nigger? As always, the white guy. Quote, kill yourself. Do it immediately. End quote. White supremacist websites. Yancey isn't a real philosopher. He just hates white people, simple. He should go, go back to Africa if he doesn't like living in a white country, end quote. Quote, this ugly nigger 
is just asking for access to more white females. In a sane world, he would be just beheaded ISIS style. Make America white again, end quote. Quote, this nigger needs to have a meat cook lovingly. Well, you know, time to use your own imagination, end quote. Quote, you can dress a nigger up in a suit and tie and they'll still be niggers, end quote. Quote, this ignorant monkey has no audience but other ignorant monkeys, end quote. Quote, Yancey, flights leave for Africa every day. Take one and take a brother with you. We can all admit bringing you to this country was a mistake. So let us get rid of you and correct the mistake. You are not happy. We're not happy with your behavior. So do it, end quote. Quote, there are two ways you can return to Africa, on a passenger ship or in a coffin freighter. Choose quickly, end quote. Many of you might also know that I wrote an article for the Times entitled, I'm a Dangerous Professor. That article was in response to the fact that my name appeared on what is called the Professor Watch List, which is a conservative website created by a conservative youth group known as Turning Point USA. The job of this watch list is to monitor professors who teach so-called leftist propaganda. From my knowledge, I am the only Emory professor who was listed. In my article, I argued that the watch list is indicative of the madness of George Orwell's 1984. I had not anticipated how the onslaught of vile and racist discourse would leave a wound, would traumatize. My physiology registered the, the wounds, mood swings, irritability, trepidation, disgust, anger, nausea. On one white supremacist website, the white author, author wrote, nigger, 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 right down the page. It was important for me to share those messages with you so that you get to feel or get a clear sense of what home means to me, how it feels to be and not to be at home simultaneously. Okay, so here's the vignette. Elevators, black fungibility, and the all too familiar stranger. Well dressed, I enter an elevator where a white woman waits to reach her floor. She sees my black body, though not the same one I have seen reflected back to me from the mirror on any number of occasions. Her body comportment signifies, look, the black. On this score though, short of a performative locution, her body language functions as an insult. And by the way, for those who are Schutz scholars, I'm very interested in how um, you might help me to think through uh, a framework that perhaps he might provide as I'm giving you this particular vignette, or for that matter, based on what I've said thus far. Her body comportment signifies, look, the black. On this score, though short of a performative locution, her body language functions as an insult, over and above how, I, how my body is clothed, regardless of the fact that I wear a suit and tie, she sees a criminal. Indeed, she does not really see me. Despite what I think about myself, how I am for myself, her perspective, her third person account seeps into my consciousness. I catch a glimpse of myself through her eyes and just for that moment, I experience some form of double consciousness. But what I see does not shatter my identity or unglue my sense of moral decency. Yet from the perspective of white hegemony, Hers is deemed the only real point of view. One might say that the white woman's consciousness of the meaning of my black body coincides with the black body as such. And that from her perspective, there is no meaning that the black body possesses that is foreign to her. That is a meaning that is capable of enlarging her field of consciousness or seeing. As Patricia Williams might say, quote, I occupy a space of the entirely judged, end quote. When she sees me, the symbolic order of blackness as evil is collapsed. I am evil. My blackness is the stimulus that triggers her response. The Negro, as Fanon notes, is a phobogenic object, a stimulus to anxiety. Her gaze is, as Judith Butler says, quote, not a simple seeing, an act of direct perception, but the racial production of the visible the workings of racial constraints on what it means to see, end quote. And I wonder, are there also racial constraints on 
who qualifies as the stranger as opposed to the not stranger. And if there are these constraints, how do we contest them, assuming that we can? As black, I am the looked at. As white, she is the bearer of the white look. But note that I have not given my consent to have my body transformed, to have it reshaped or thrown back to me as something I'm supposed to own, as a meaning I'm supposed to accept. She clutches her purse, eagerly anticipating the arrival of her floor, knowing that this black predator will soon strike. As she clutches her purse, I am reminded of the sounds of white people locking their car doors as they catch a glimpse of my black body as I walk by. And by the way, these, these examples are really my ways of sort of engaging the life world, of engaging these everyday quotidian um, experiences that I undergo, how I experience my life in an anti-Black white America. But the beauty is that I'm using sort of these phenomenologically thick descriptions to communicate those to you. White filmmaker Amy Sands, Sands tells the story of how she and her sister would travel from Westchester County to New York City with their grandparents. She says when they reached Black neighborhoods, the windows of her, car, of her grandparents' car would close and the doors would lock. Quote, until black faces appear on the street, then the sleek electric windows slide up and suck down, the automatic locks click down, the dark people are sealed out, we are sealed in. So I'm moving from the elevator scenario just for a moment. When I walk down the street and pass by cars filled with white people, the sounds of car doors is or are deafening. Click, 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 click. Indeed, clicking sounds are always already accompanied by white nervous gestures and eyes that want to look but are hesitant to do so. The clicks ensure their safety, effectively re-signifying their white bodies as in need of protection vis-a-vis -vis the sight of danger, death, doom, blackness, the stranger. In fact, the clicks return me to myself as this dangerous beast, a phantom, rendering my body the site of microtomy and volatility. The clicks attempt to seal my identity as a dark savage. The clicking sounds mark me, they inscribe me, rematerializing my presence as it were in ways that I know to be untrue, in ways that are not me. Unable to stop the clicking, unable to stop white women from tightening the hold of their purses as I walk by, unable to stop white women from crossing to the other side of the street once they have seen me walking in their direction, unable to stop white men from looking several times over their shoulders as I walk behind them minding my own business, unable to establish a form of recognition that creates a space for trust or liminality. In other words, how do I feel at home? There are times when I want to become their fantasy, to become their black monster, their boogeyman. In the case of the clicks, I want to pull open the car door and shout, surprise, you've been carjacked by a ghost, by a fantasy of your own creation. Now get out of the car. But of course, this act of agency, this act of protest would simply reinforce the racist stereotype of the black male as brutal and as violent, as the one who will contaminate and therefore ought to be ostracized. Okay. Like those white people in their cars, the white woman on the elevator fears that a direct look might incite the anger of the black predator. She fakes a smile. By her smile, she hopes to elicit a spark of decency from me, but I don't return the smile. I fear that it might be interpreted as a gesture of sexual advance. After all, within the social space of the elevator, which has become a hermeneutic transactional space, Within, within which all of my intended meanings get falsified. It is as if I am no longer in charge of what I mean or I intend. What she sees or hears is governed by a racist epistemology of certitude that places me under erasure. Although he is writing about what he calls the serious sadist, uh, what Gordon, Lewis Gordon says, aptly applies to the white woman in the elevator. Gordon writes that, quote, such a being becomes the point of view from which others are seen and thus manifest a desire to see without being seen. Since a consequence of being the only point of view is the absence of others, end quote. Hence on this score, the world that the white woman desires, as Gordon would say, quote, is a world without what phenomenologists in the Schutzian tradition call sociality. 
Sociality is the intersubjective world, the world of others, a world which requires the self and others, and a self as other to those other selves, end quote. So what's happening here, you see, is complicating the self other distinction. Sociality, I'm arguing, is being denuded. It's deflationary. However, the white woman's alleged literacy regarding the semiotics of my black body is actually an instance of profound illiteracy. But perhaps the secret partly lies in her becoming illegible to herself. Her gaze upon my black body might be said to function like a camera obscura. Her gaze consists of a racist socio-epistemic aperture, as it were, through which the light, the white light of truth casts an inverted distorted image. It is through her gaze that I become hypervigilant of my own embodied spatiality. On previous occasions, particularly when alone on an elevator, I have moved my body within the space of the elevator in non-calculative fashion. And if anybody's, of course, you all are familiar with Heidegger, I'm talking about the sense of being in the elevator on these occasions, where things are, as it were, ready to hand. The movement away from the familiar is what is affected vis-a-vis -vis the white woman's gaze. My movements become and remain stilted. I dare not move suddenly. The apparent racial neutrality of the space within the elevator, when, let's say, she is standing alone, has become one filled with white normativity now that I have entered the elevator. I feel trapped. I no longer feel bodily expansiveness within the elevator, but constrained. I now begin to calculate, paying almost neurotic attention to the proximic positioning of my body, making sure that this black object, what now feels like an appendage, a weight is not too close, not too tall, not too threatening. So I genuflect, but only slightly, a movement that feels like an act of worship, Notice that she need not speak a word to render my body captive. She need not scream rape. She need not call me nigger. Indeed, it is not a necessary requirement that she hates me in order for her to script my body in the negative ways that she does. Perhaps all that is needed is a gaze, a glance, a movement of the hand. White America has bombarded me and other black males with the reality, quote unquote, of our hyper dual sexualization. You are a sexual trophy and yet a certain rapist. Fanon, aware of the horrible narrative myths used to depict black bodies, notes that the Negro is the genital and is the incarnation of evil, being that which is to be avoided and yet desired. This point captures what I think Schutz suggests where he writes, quote, prejudices are rationalizations and institutionalizations of the underlying central myth upon which the self-interpretation of the group is founded. It makes little sense to tell the, the uh, negrophobe in the South that in terms of biological science, there is no such thing as a Negro race." End quote. What then am I to do? Within this racially saturated field of visibility, I have somehow become this predator stereotype or this predator typification from which it appears hopeless to escape. The white woman thinks that her act of seeing me is an act of knowing what I am, of knowing what I will do next. That is, hers is believed to be simply a process of unmediated, uninterpreted perception. Michael Barber writes, quote, for Schutz, our life world experience of each other is a matter of co-performing subjectivities interacting in freedom and fr with freedom in freedom with the other, end quote. Well, clearly something has failed and has done so horribly. And yet to be black, the experience of being shut down in this way where there isn't the co-perform, where there isn't co-performing subjectivities. This is experienced every day in the quotidian. So it's not a spectacular moment for the black body. It's an everyday moment of the quotidian. The white woman's coming to see me as she does is actually a cultural achievement, which says something like, I have arrived, I am white. But that is an achievement 
that not only distorts her body, but also, also distorts, not only distorts my body, but also distorts her white body. Historically, think of those black bodies that felt alien to themselves, feeling their understanding of their uh, own bodies slip away from them, perhaps even pushing them ever closer toward the precipice of epistemic violence, ever closer to living in a state of self-hatred. Phenomenologically, it is as if I become black on each occasion within every new context of each encounter with the generative dimensions of the white gaze or the white imaginary. I am, as it were, a phantom, indeed a spook, that lives between the interstices of my physical, phenotypically dark body and the white woman's gesticulatory performances. She performs, ergo, I become the criminal. Within the dynamic racialized space of the elevator, I've become the externalized figure, the fantasized object of the white woman's own white distortion. It is this distortion that carries an existential and ontological surplus, providing her with a sense of positivity vis-a-vis -vis my negativity. On the elevator, do I enact a disruptive counter-white racist performance? or perhaps a counter typification? If so, what would this look like? And what if such a performance gets reinterpreted within her racial schema? I could also strike a, a conversation while on the elevator. I could say something like, I am a philosopher with a PhD and I also attended Yale University. There is the possibility though, that her white gaze, her white imaginary is so fixed that this newly discovered information would not shake her framework or the processes of typification. Her head would say yes, but her body would say no. I could also attempt to trigger a sense of shame by saying something like, Miss, I assure you that I am not interested in your trashy possessions, and I especially have no desire to humiliate you through the violence of rape, nor are my sexual desires outside of my control. Thank you very much. In this case, I position my moral subjectivity in such a way that she relationally comes to take up the position of a particular kind of subject one who feels shame. In other words, this shame is a constituted effect produced through the effective positioning of myself as a moral actor within this diet. Perhaps as I leave the elevator, I have gained a victory, affirming my dignity and sending her on a journey of discovery regarding the layers of her whiteness. Then again, she could be thinking, just who do you think you're talking to? This would function as a way of alighting the truth that she felt threatened by what she and other whites daily construct as the typified black monster, while still maintaining a sense of superiority by questioning that I spoke to her in such an uppity fashion. Then again, what if I have indeed positioned her to feel shame? What if she leaves the elevator feeling bad about what she did, feeling bad about her whiteness? But what happens when this feeling gets quickly transformed into a positive sense of self-discovery? What if she now takes that discovery to indicate a form of transcendence beyond all things white and racist? She becomes no longer concerned with my pain and my suffering, my typification as the stranger, but she's now concerned with her pain, her guilt, her need to feel good, pure and ethical. In short, she fails to tarry with black pain and suffering. And she also fails to tarry with the complexity of her whiteness. What appeared to be a movement toward challenging her whiteness is reinscribed as a place for precisely doing her whiteness. In short, she is still at home. I am still homeless. Well, and I'm just about done here. I just got two pages, that's it. Well, what if the elevator broke down for six hours? Would this create a space for her death? or perhaps her salvation, or perhaps this is a distinction without a difference. What if she got to know me differently during these six hours? What if her perceptual practices began to crack, though slightly? Is this not the beginning of a bridge? Perhaps we need more experiences where the spaces that we inhabit break down, where the fixed modes of typification or typification break down, like the elevator, spaces where we get to dwell near each other, where white people get to see that they are the problem, that they are in fact the stranger. In conclusion, 
this is what I have in mind. And this is new stuff for me in terms of how I'm thinking about this. So the elevator breaks down. The breaking is indicative of a disruption, a fissuring, a disorientation, a crisis vis-a-vis -vis whiteness. It may involve what James Baldwin would call, quote, the breakup of the world as one has always known it, the loss of all that gave one an identity, the end of safety, end quote. Within the broken down elevator, kenosis, it's a wonderful term that I like, it's K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Within the broken down elevator, kenosis is possible, which is a certain kind of death or emptying of white racist sedimentations, assumptions, images, typifications, affects, performances of perverse anonymity. Metanoia is possible, which involves a kind of surrender, abandonment. It seems to me that all of these are important concepts when we're thinking about the stranger. Perhaps there's a kind of Damascene moment. Perhaps within this broken space, shall we say a broken makeshift spatial dwelling? The white woman's, so there's a way in which I'm arguing that the space of the elevator, now that it's broken down, has created a new site of what it means to be at home and therefore contests my identity as stranger, but perhaps redefines her as stranger. So perhaps within this broken space, shall we call it a broken makeshift spatial dwelling, the white woman's being dilates and takes the form of an ontological generosity, one that is also importantly critical of its acts of giving, its openness. This speaks to what French Caribbean philosopher Edward Glissant, which I mentioned earlier, earlier had in mind where he writes, quote, thought of the other is the moral generosity disposing me to accept the principle of alterity, to conceive of the world as not simple and straightforward, with only one truth, mine, end quote. Yet he warns us, quote, but thought of the other can dwell within me without making me alter course, without prizing me apart, without changing me within myself, end quote. This is why he further writes, quote, thought of the other is sterile without the other of thought, end quote. The question that the white woman needs to pose is the following. And for those who know the work of Luce Irigaray, I'm using it at the moment. Now, Luce Irigaray had nothing to say of real, any, any real significance about race. So I'm using it for this purpose. The question that the white woman needs to pose is this. Who art thou? In that moment, there isn't the absolute closure of knowing already. Metaphorically, perhaps there is a loosening of the ropes tied to her that, is, that ties her to the mask of the ship, as we have in the case of Odysseus. The contingency of history is felt in that space. Perhaps we can call this a space of hesitation, which Alia al Saji sees as feeling, quote, one's way tentative, tentatively and, and receptively, end quote. Just as the broken down elevator delays the white, woman's, the white woman from going home, the white woman's certainty is also delayed, postponed. We should keep in mind that while the question, who art thou, is a question that is implicative of moral generosity, it can also counter the consumptive dynamics of white care white giving, where my alterity or otherness or strangeness is, a, is eclipsed precisely by the act of the white woman's just generosity, her very act of giving. It is a case where my being does not exceed her care or concern, where her generosity functions as a form of imprisonment. Read radically, however, who art thou ought to trouble the white woman's own sense of white enclosed or impervious self-identity, where the I am is not totally legible within the framework of her white giving, but also where she poses the self-reflexive question while we're in that elevator, who am I? In this case, she is confronted with her own porosity where she becomes importantly illegible to herself, where she is also excessive and not frozen in the act of touching without being touched. I would argue that this is what love looks like. White people, as James Baldwin would say, 
must stand and confront history, do battle with forms of historical creation that have gotten us to this place, a place where whiteness and white people refuse or fail to be undone, fail to lose themselves to an address that comes from outside of themselves. Baldwin says, quote, love take, takes off the masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within, end quote. Black theologian James Combs says, quote, love is a ra radical refusal to accept whiteness. To love is to make a decision against white racism, end quote. Then again, what happens when the elevator starts up again? What happens when we leave the elevator? The white woman returns to a world in which white skin privilege is systemic, where her white identity continues to be complicit with white norms, white myths, perverse forms of anonymity, where other whites come to live their lives effortlessly, where whiteness as the transcendental norm is still full in play, shaping her embodied perceptions and her comportment, where she moves through the world in the mode of a white solipsist, in a world in which she and other whites continue to find their way, where they continue to live lives predicated upon lies and where their racism continues to go unmarked. Yet, where I also continue to live a life of the typified black stranger, interchangeable, fungible, the nigger. I am guilty. They embody white innocence. Thank you. So much, George. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I guess we should uh, see if there's any questions that people have or any comments. We've got a very fruitful conversation, I think, that George is. Is it okay if I take a second break? I'll be right back. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. I'll be right, right back. Thank you. Yeah. In the interim, we might talk about the procedure for questions. You'll notice, I know you know that there's an icon at the bottom of Zoom where you can raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I will uh, cue your microphone and you, should, you will be able to ask your question. Please also note for security reasons, I'm sort of cross-checking those who ask questions to make sure you are on our program. And so I think uh, for most that I can see uh, on my list that that's true. So uh, we are being careful about security. So I'll cue your microphone when you're done with your question, then uh, I will take it off. So you can start raising your hand now. Okay, thank um, you for that great question. <laughs> yeah, sure. John Strassheim? Yes. John Strassheim? Yes. There you go. No. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, I, have, I have kind of a random question here. I think I, I read an article uh, in the morning about the issue of how to spell black with a capital B or, or, a, or a lowercase one. And um, um, the, the author was a Minna Salami, is a Finnish Nigerian author. and. She criticized that for, for different reasons, and I, I felt somehow uncomfortable. And I think now, after hearing your talk, I, I realize what made me feel uncomfortable um, is that if um, so the black black is spelled with a capital B, uh, white is spelled with a lowercase one, and it it reminds me of um, of what you said about marked and unmarked uh, states. Sort of black is looks like the marked state, sort of a white person is just a person, like you said, is regarded as just a person, just a guy coming to the elevator, um, while a black person is instantly perceived as a black person, sort of as a marked 
case. I, I wonder if that makes any sense. Uh, yeah, sure, it, do, it does make sense. But uh, let me let me give you a little history of that, though. Um, w. E. B. Du Bois and other black black scholars uh, early on in this country um, made a point uh, that they wanted to capitalize the end for Negro, and so they fought hard for that because the very capitalization of that the, of the end was a way in which they kind of uh, affirmed or legitimated their identity rather than the lowercase. So the capitalization actually, and this might be counter sort of to what you're saying, but the capitalization of the term was actually a way of legitimating one's identity, of legitimating one's humanity uh, by saying that we are this group, as a group, we are, we need to capitalize that. And so by that lexical difference, uh, the lexical difference points to a certain kind of claimed ontology a kind of claimed humanity. Um, now, for me, strategically, uh, through an act of resistance, I tend to lowercase white uh, when I'm writing it out and uppercase black. Now, that's not to reverse anything like um, a, a kind of, a kind of um, anti-racist racism. No, uh, it's my way of, of marking whiteness as the lowercase by dethroning it, as it were, at, through this lexical uh, modification. So, um, so yeah, so th it has a history, the capitalization of Negro and hence the capitalization of Black, but it was more for political, sort of deeper um, forms, uh, uh, deeper reasons that involve uh, the necessity for forms of recognition. Um, but uh, but again, the, the lower casing, the, the, white, the white for me is just a kind of strategical lexical resistance. If you want to follow up with that, I, I'm fine with that. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Other questions? Eric Garrett. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, uh, thanks, George, for a great, great presentation. Uh, I always enjoy hearing you speak and is a perfect kind of talk uh, as usual. So uh, I have a question um, about the, I, I was thinking, reflecting on your, your example and uh, of the ele the elevator and one just how, how it re resonated to me of you know Fanon and, and blacks being white mass and his experience in France, uh, but also um, the I'm, 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 it it made me kind of rethink or think about um, there's a particular notion of anonymity I think that kind of goes on right and I think this is if I'm remembering. Um, I think uh, from Lewis Gordon, he says something about this too, but the type of anonymity of black bodies in these spaces is both simultaneously, uh, it's one of over-determination, but yet like under-determination as well. So that if, on the one hand, you know, there's, um, you know, you're, you're only seen as, as this, you know, a, as race, but yet you're, you know, there's this, um, um, over to, you know, there's this overdetermination where it's everything is only seen as race too, right? So it's only in everything at this kind of same time. So there's this really um, unusual sort of epistemic operation of anonymity that goes on in racism. So I'm just wondering um, if, you know, if your example really kind of kind of triggered that. I mean, so I'm wondering if you have any sort of reactions to that about the anonymity of uh, black bodies and racism that, it, there is such an epistemic kind of complexity in terms of both overdetermination and uh, and underdetermination. So that's just my my question. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for that, Eric. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I'm I'm I am not I am I am all the more comfortable to 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 direct those who are interested in this to the work of, of Lewis Gordon. In fact, I, I would suggest you you look at his his book um, entitled Her Majesty's Other Children, or even uh, his text, um, uh, Existentia Africana. Um, and you, you're right, I think you're right, Eric. And, and, and Lewis certainly does this too, where uh, this kind of anonymity 
this perverse anonymity that he's talking about. And I suggest, I mean, again, I'm not a Schutz scholar, but uh, I, I suspect that for Schutz, this anonymity is a, a bit more benign uh, in as much as it's a kind of constituted background in which mm -hmm. we kind of move through the world, uh, a kind of Lebensfeld, where uh, we see people doing things. They're going about their business. There are these kinds of transactions that are happening. Um, uh, but, but again, it's, it's benign, right? It's a kind mm -hmm. of benign quotidian everydayness. Whereas when my body shows up, for example, in the elevator, when the white woman is in the elevator, the, the space within the elevator is not considered raced because she's in the elevator. Because to be white is to be human qua human, is to be person qua person. So there is no race, mm -hmm. there is no deviance, there is no dif difference in the elevator. There is the ontological same in the elevator. But when I enter the elevator, somehow race enters. And you're right, there's a way in which, there's a way in which I want to be anonymous to the extent that etymologically anonymous means sort of no name, right? Mm. I want to be that person who has no name. I often think about the early, assuming that you all are familiar with the um, Clint Eastwood movies, the spaghetti mm. westerns, you know, he comes into town and he's the mysterious one. No one knows him. No one knows his name, right? But mm. my name is already known. I am the nigger. I am the black. I, and where, where the black is overdetermined, I am the, the site of inferiority. I'm the site of the hypersexual. I'm the site of the, of the, race, of the rapist. I'm the site of the ersatz, the site of the savage, the site of nullification. You mm -hmm. name it, right? The site of, of stupidity. Uh, and so there's a way in which I am overdetermined mm -hmm. and yet underdetermined, paradoxically, because there's a way in which that overdetermination completely misses who I want to be or how I am, how I am seen, right? So as Lewis Gordon often puts this, it is in, it is in my hypervisibility that I am visible. Or there are times when I am not visible precisely in my visibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, so epistemically, for the white person then, um, the epistemic is a site of closure. It's a site of foreclosure. It's a site of, of uh, epistemic totalization, where my being uh, can't escape, well, apparently can't escape that Procrustean framing, right? Mm -hmm. Because either I'm too much of X or I'm less of X, right? So there's no Goldilocks blackness, as it were, <laughs> right? It's, it's, it's not there, right? Um, and, and I think this is this is important uh, phenomenologically and also just in terms of my own sanity to be black in America, in a place called home. And if mm. you're home, it's a place where you're accepted. But the overdetermination of the black body is not a case of acceptance. And the underdetermination of the black body is not a place of acceptance. Mm -hmm. right? So in either case, these extremes get me wrong and render my body homeless. I don't know if you want me to say more about that. Just follow up, Eric. No, no, that, that's great. No, thanks very much. And, and it's interesting too how that that overdetermination, where you know you're in the elevator and you have to, you know, your 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 overdetermined is every black or this sort of you know vicious you know black or something. But that doesn't happen for whiteness, right? So as a white male, I'm never, oh, you're the, you know, you're the the typical serial killer or something like this. <laughs> that that overdetermination doesn't happen ever in whiteness. That's right. That, that's what I would argue. Absolutely. Because it doesn't happen precisely because whiteness is a transcendental norm. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is the norm that determines what is to be overdetermined mm -hmm. right? or underdetermined or how, however that works out, right? But it's impossible, well, not impossible, but seemingly impossible, unless someone here can come up with a, a, a quote-unquote solution. Maybe that's too strong. Um, but the way in which one might um, disengage from that overdetermination. And by the way, it is a weight. It is an existential weight. And this is why, if you read the work of someone like Peggy McIntosh, she talks about white privilege as this invisible weightless knapsack. So the weightlessness goes hand in hand, Eric, with what you're talking about as a white male. Uh, you're not overdetermined. You're not mm -hmm. carrying that, those multiple layers, integuments, as it were, skins, 
that you have to pull off ad infinitum, right? Mm. There is just you. Mm. There is just you. And one longs for that, to be oneself. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Gary, there's a, a, a message on the question and answer from Alexis Gross, and then I see that there are three raised hands. Alexis, do you, would you like to say, say something? I noticed you read a question and answer in, input. Do you hear me? Yes. OK. Thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, the way in which you describe the situation of being black in white America reminds me of Sartre's, Sartre's analysis of the look and also of his study of the Jewish question. Uh, the white gaze imposes upon the black subject uh, typification, and the latter has now to deal with this burden or uh, with the weight, as you said. In which sense is your perspective influenced by, by Sartre? Yeah, good. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, I would say that it is uh, uh, the, the Sartre of, of Black Orpheus uh, influences me more. I, particularly, I like there where Sartre says, for the last, he says something like, I, I'm, it's not quite verbatim, but for the last 3,000 years, the white man has been, has had the privilege of being the looker or the look, right? Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to even describe the, the whiteness itself, not, not, he doesn't limit the look just to the ocular. He says that whiteness itself, the body as it were, exudes a kind of positionality of power. And, and he says it, 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 it pulls things out of their, as it were, out of their mystery. So whiteness has this kind of epistemic um, privilege, a certain kind of epistemic authority. Uh, think of the enlightenment. Uh, think of the way in which whiteness brings law and order, logos. Whiteness is synonymous with reason. It is that which uncovers. It's that which might be said to be aluthia or aletheia, right? And as much as, as whiteness doesn't, on this view, dwell in the river of Lethe. But of course, I want to argue that whiteness is precisely drowning in the river of Lethe because it doesn't see itself. It needs to be unconcealed. So yes, the Sartre of Black Orpheus I like, and also the Sartre of being a nothingness in this case. But the difference is that in that case, um, for Sartre, there seems to be, uh, and for those Sartrean scholars can, can correct me here, there seems to be a kind of, of uh, back and forth rigidity with respect to the Sartrean gaze and perhaps even um, subjectivity, where there's a kind of mutually exclusive subjectivity or mutually exclusive gazing. Um, and perhaps I don't want to give, I don't want to say in an anti-Black world that there is that kind of Sartrean contestation that he seems to give uh, both subjects, uh, rather that that mutuality is hierarchically arranged, and there's hege and one is hegemonic, which means there's a relationship of a power differential, um, such that both gazes are not operating on mutual terms. Again, if there's a Sartre scholar, you know, jump in and, and tell me if I'm wrong. Um, so I would I would I, I would think Black Orpheus Sartre, yes, uh, Sartre who is uh, very much a friend, although Fanon says he's not sure if he's a friend of uh, Fanon. Um, but uh, so I'm influenced by Sartre in that regard. But the idea, I don't think early on in his work, he gives enough um, looks at whiteness, uh, sorry, looks at the gaze in terms of its structuration through, uh, through uh, the power of whiteness or through the power of race. So I'd say yes and no. I Thank hope you. that answers your question. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Sure. We've got some hands up, Jerry. I'm sure you're. Hello. Yes, Thomas. Thank you very much for this talk. It was really touching, you, especially your examples, what you had to experience with all these males that uh, brought tears into my eyes. Mm. Uh, I have a question. My question is, when I'm in India, 
it's conspicuous how few white people are around, mostly tourists. If I enter there an elevator, I think it's me who brings race into the elevator, not the Indians. So I think there it's also a question of majority and minority of races. But of course, I see there's a, a lot of background with the colonization. Uh, for example, I, I think it's a question who has the definition, the power of definition. Uh, for example, in colonial Africa, the white were a minority but had the power of definition. Maybe it that changes also. I think, I mean, India, for example, was never colonized in this way as African countries. It was colonized, but more on a uh, collaborative level too. And colonialism is pretty absent today. I, I experienced the Indians as really, really self-reliant and uh, uh, self-conscious and I, I don't think they look up to me because I'm white. So I think, uh, I, this is my question, what do you think about this? I mean, uh, you have the special case that you as a black man are part of a minority in the US and as well, the history that the white people in this country always had the power of definition, uh, who is what? What do you think about this context, this societal context? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And I'm glad you said that you, I, I assume you are also, you identify as white. Um, yeah, th this, is, this, is, this is interesting. And I'm, 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 I thought you were going in another direction to which I had a response. I was developing my response already, uh, but you didn't, which is good, but I'll say something about it nonetheless. First of all, I think you're right about the power of definition. Uh, which means the, the power of who controls the language, who controls the discourse. And, you know, if we think about the discursive, the way in which uh, um, uh, Foucault talks about discourse as de denoting those set of practices that shape that of which it describes or speaks about, right? You can think here of Sarah Bartman, the so-called hot and tot Venus, as a perfect example of how Georges Cuvier, the anatomist, uh, discursively constructed her body as that which is hypersexual. Uh, you can think about the way in which uh, language, white discourse, constructs a Trayvon Martin or Tiana, uh, Breonna Taylor or a George Floyd, right? Um, so I think you're right about the power of discourse. I would say the power of discourse, the power of the ability to point. Uh, in the case that Eric raised earlier, look, notice that it's the white child on the train who says, <laughs> look, a Negro. Right. Look, a Negro. And, and, and you think, well, but it's a child. It's a child. But the child is actually a site, not only of the perpetuation of racialized injustice and the language, look, a Negro, but the child is also being, as it were, um, the site through which language in a larger social context is speaking through the child itself. Right? So the child is given this kind of perlocutionary, or not perlocutionary, uh, illocutionary power that has a kind of perlocutionary impact on Fanon, right? And I'm, I'm glad you made the point about the context because I agree with you that the, the majority um, is, is irrelevant to who has the power. So that if, a, if I were in South Africa on an elevator with a, with a white South African, um, uh, I, I nonetheless become the racialized body. I still become the site of racialization or the marked body, despite the majority being black, right? So nonetheless, they still have the power. But two or three, I wanna make sure that we don't um, reduce the power to the discursive because the discursive is also part and parcel of uh, the imaginary. It's part and parcel of sedimented historical practices that are embedded not only in bodies, but in institutions. So we can't separate the power of the language from the power that undergirds the language, which is institutional and material, right? And that's the difference here in terms of how we have power. In terms of you being in India, though, I'm not sure what to make of that um, when you're in India 
I think you said that you do bring race to the elevator. I think you said that. Um, um, I, I would argue, and that, that's really interesting. So the question then becomes, in the Indian context, how is whiteness as race being marked? Is it being marked as whiteness as an indicator of your Americanness? Or sorry, maybe it's not American. Wherever you happen to be from, and they don't think you're from America. But the, the way in which uh, that whiteness signifies something over and above racialization, right? I would wonder if we were to, to engage. So this is an empirical question. If we were to talk to those Indians there, how would they see you, right? They certainly would see you as white. But I wonder if that whiteness would be perceived in the sense of racialization qua uh, blackness or racialization qua difference where difference is not, uh, where difference is the ersatz, right? There's a way in which even in those spaces, those Indian spaces, you maintain a certain kind of uh, markings that is not a kind of racialized markings as a problem but you, take, you are the embodiment of both whiteness as phenotypic, but also whiteness as the transcendental norm. And it's whiteness as the transcendental norm that spells out the difference in terms of your whiteness as phenotype. So I'm arguing that you are both racialized, quote unquote, as white phenotypically, but also you're also whiteness as the transcendental norm where that where that whiteness is a master signifier that is not a part of a chain of significations that imply difference. I hope that makes sense. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got another hands up question here. I think. Sullivan, you are cued. Hi there. My name is, is Sullivan, and thank you, Dr. George. Your essay on the, the violent weight of whiteness has been very influential on me and, and my studies. And my, my question is about white identity and the, the closure and, and fear related to that and the unwillingness to let oneself be unsutured as a white person. And it, and it reminds me of what Schutz has to say with motivational relevance is, and that as a white person and, and in my conversations with other white people, there's the, um, the motivation to protect my identity and how in order to unsuture myself, I have to risk the destabilization that comes with accepting truths about my history and, and, and about like the suffering that has been imposed by, that has been caused by white people. And so my my question is, is about, is it in addition to closure, is it also about the limit of our story making capabilities as white people, our inability oh. to create new stories about, um, or sorry, so is it about an unwillingness to sacrifice the stories that we have created? So to allow like a new story to unfold about about who we are. Wow, that's that's really good. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that one, but uh, I will make something of it. Um, and by the way, the the, the the gentleman who asked the question previously, that was uh, Thomas, right? Uh, and I, I just wanted to thank Thomas for something that he picked up on. Uh, I just wanna say that I appreciate Thomas for bringing attention to the racist uh, vitriol that I received and for his, um, his affective generosity in terms of how it impacted him. Often when I mention these, people seem to forget about what I said and we immediately go to the philosophical. So I wanna, well, that's philosophical too, but I wanna just say, I appreciate raising that. Now, uh, Sullivan, this is a really good question. Um, I would say partly, and I like this idea of motivational relevance, although it's new to me. Uh, I don't remember writing that into my, my paper for Nathanson, but um, I think we have to somehow get to, how do we generate, how do we create a space for uh, creating generative moments for different kinds of 
I'll call them motivational relevances, right? Assuming that I'm using this language correctly. How are motivational uh, relevances um, uh, themselves truncated and part of a larger meta-narrative predicated on something like whiteness? So I'm, I think you're right. There, there's something to be said. Uh, and there is that um, closure. Closure implies safety. Um, safety implies uh, being able to walk through the world with effortless grace. It is, as Sarah Ahmad says, uh, in this case, it means when you, as Merle Ponty would put it, you're able to walk down the street where your, um, where your, your body, uh, where your actions trail behind uh, your body, right? Or rather, sorry, where your body trails behind your actions. In the case of whiteness, it would require white people to make their bodies a full frontality. Would, they would have to come to understand their bodies as strange and themselves as strangers, which means that uh, whiteness would begin to break as an ontological plenitude. So look, I think ontologically, we are what I would call homo narrans. These terms are not new with me. We are homo narrans. We're storytellers. They have passive and active dimensions. We are homo significans, active and passive dimensions. But we're also, uh, I would say, homo absconditus. Um, they're, they're, this is, I'm arguing, ontological. Uh, homo absconditus might be seen as the equivalent of what Judith Butler refers to as psychic excess. But the problem is that there is the inability to risk. Uh, and I'm going to go with your, with your saying. I think the discourse, and it's not only the discourse, discourse qua narrative, but it's also that, and that's where you, that's where you raise the question. And I think that uh, there, what's required is a reconceptualization of the white self as homo narrans and as homo significans. Um, to know that these stories uh, are not themselves um, uh, uh, places from nowhere or uh, are sites that are um, uh, Oh, oh, how does uh, Spinoza put that? Um, Subspecie aeternitatis. Uh, white stories uh, obfuscate their origins. Uh, the meta narratives obfuscate their contingency because part of the obfuscation is to avoid a kind of liberatory genealogical critique where whites will begin to understand wait, this identity has a beginning in a story that is itself profoundly distorted, <laughs> profoundly a story that has to do with their own problems, their own uh, identity problems, their own need to be libidinally invested in black bodies. This is why Baldwin says that I give you your problem back. He says, you're the nigger baby, it isn't me. So in a way, we're asking white people to, uh, it, to keep it with what you're saying, the way you framed it, to get them to fracture these narratives, fracture narratives that give them coherence, to give white people coherence, intervene in the stories that uh, are undergirded by a certain kind of intelligibility that is thoroughly historical, thoroughly socially constructed. But that involves uh, sort of doing what Charles Mills says, uh, it's, 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 the, the narratives are a function of epistemology of ignorance, where the narratives themselves enable white people to construct a world and to tell a story about a world that they themselves fail to realize came from themselves. <laughs> right? So there's a way in which the self-narrator conveniently forgets that the story is not uh, one that is autonomous. Or, or even autochthonous, growing from the ground, it is fundamentally and profoundly heteronymous. It has a history. So I think that's what we have to do. We have to make white people, I'm gonna say this in a, a, a sort of tongue in teeth, better critical genealogists, right? uh, to understand the ways in which they look at the foundations of their identity as libidinally, again, constructed, but constructed around a narrative that already positions me as the stranger. Already I am not at home. Already I am the contaminant. 
already I am the monstrous, the teratological. So I think you're right. Uh, I'm not sure if it will end there, but I, I do believe what you're saying is incredibly important, that the, the language, the discourse, the story is complicit with the power. It's complicit with maintaining safety. So what white people have to do is tell a different story. But the fear of telling that dis, this, this counter story, this counter narrative will mean that they have to face their own finitude, their own fallibility and their own fragility. And that is hard. And by fragility, I mean just this sense of being con thoroughly contingent uh, and being uh, dependent rather than a certain kind of autonomous ontological independence or just a mere neoliberal subject or atomistic or something of the sort. Does that, does that get at it? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Jerry. I don't see other hands. I have seen a couple in the past. Car uh, Carlos Belvedere had one. I saw Valerie early at uh, Valerie Bentz too. Valerie, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, there's a hand. Yeah. Good. Valerie, your mic is cued. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, what a powerful and, and wonderful and amazing presentation. Thank you so much. I'm kind of shaky inside from it because I am the woman in the elevator. <laughs> I am a white woman. I've struggled to become a scholar and often feeling like in order to become accepted as a scholar, got my doctorate in 1975, not too many women then, uh, I had to be like a man, <laughs> a white man. <laughs> I laugh about it now. However, I think the idea of the transcendental, uh, the transcendental identity being white I also feel like the transcendental identity is also male. And um, I remember when I first started to grow breasts as a young woman in Milwaukee in the German neighborhood that was rapidly becoming integrated, I couldn't step out on my front porch without having guys drive by in cars and whistle. I couldn't walk down the street and just be me. I had to be hooted at. <laughs> I caught my own reflection as a blonde young woman growing breasts. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a woman who is a sex object. But uh, I'm very moved by this now because it's... Uh, it's another transcendental identity where we can't as a woman be just be. We have to be, especially when we're younger. <laughs> I'm not so more in that position anymore at my age, but a sex object immediately, not only to, to all men, it seems, of all ages. And it still is, is so true that we are the most abused gender all over the world. And so I don't mean to un underplay that I, I'm white, but also I remember hearing Coretta King say, I feel much more oppressed having been a woman than having been black. Mm. So I just, I don't really have a question, but your, your talk raised some really deep issues, concerns for me. And also because it also reaffirmed for me the power of phenomenology as I work with students in what we now call transformative phenomenology. Wow. As we work with students to ask them to write protocols about what they deeply care about using bracketing, deeply bracketing where you came from, using a point in experience, uncovering our identities that way, we find that we can open up uh, to a newer form of the transcendental that's even beyond the body. 
And I just wanted to add a little addendum to this that now with the possibility for young people as teenagers to decide they want to discard their gender because their gender doesn't feel like home, there may have been a time when I might have decided, oh my gosh, I don't want to have these breasts. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to be stared at and spotted at and whistled mm. at. Mm. I might have become a man. And what would that have meant? It's just that I, I'm again grateful to you for raising these very fundamental issues of who we are phenomenologically and rate not to underplay race as so basic, but also gender. And maybe age is another one of those that <laughs> plays on it. I know Jerry Williams has written about what powerful essay and who am I now that I'm old? <laughs> you know, I'm no longer myself. So again, thank you. And just wanted yeah. your comments on this. Thank you. Well, that's a lot. Um, th well, thank you. I mean, you, you've kind of, I don't know if there's anything to add, but I will add something. Um, I think what you're pointing to is, is really interesting. I think more work needs to be done in terms of pointing out the way in which, as I'm using the transcendental norm, and of course, I'm not using transcendental there, as I made clear earlier, as something necessary or universal, uh, but certainly something thoroughly contingent, but yet uh, nonetheless global. It might be what Foucault, when he, call, he calls it the uh, unconscious a priori, it may function in that way as well. But what you're pointing out is important because there's a way in which uh, I'm talking about whiteness as a transcendental norm, but to, to engage this fully, one would have to, well, I'm going to keep it that way, but th there's a way in which to engage it differently, one could begin to think about the ways in which whiteness as the transcendental norm works in terms of how we think about gender, um, how we think about age. Uh, I wrote down as you were talking how we think about ability, for an example. Right? There are ways in which um, there seems to be these multiple uh, um, transcendental normative sites. Right? So I'm, I'm interested in all of those and in the way in which the stranger gets marked and estranged vis-a-vis -vis one of these other uh, markings, whether it's ability, age, gender, sexual orientation, class, et cetera. And I'm also interested in what that means when, for example, we're talking about white, male, cisgender, capitalist, you see where I'm going, right? So you're tagging all these together in which someone, some of us seem to participate in all of these ways in which uh, whiteness is, sorry, the transcendental norm operates as a binary structure, as a hegemonic structure, and as this site, site of, is, as a site of the hierarch, hierarchical. And I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you brought the, the, the issue of your own identity in the way in which you disclosed through your own vulnerability, uh, how you uh, were, how you were experienced, or how you experienced yourself vis-a-vis -vis the male gaze, because I argue, or I, I am not. I think part of the problem is that we as men also have to call ourselves out. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I am too a sexist. Um, it seems to me that uh, I might be this way for the rest of my life, because kenosis or emptying is not something that happens in one moment. There is no total single or singular canonic moment. I wish there were, but there isn't. Um, but I also have internalized various kinds of toxic um, forms of masculinity. The male gaze, which is Procrustean, which attempts to fit your body as Procrustes' bed did, to fit you into this bed. <laughs> and that's, that has multiple <laughs> entendres, right? It's very interesting, yeah. but to get you to fit. And I like what you're saying here. Not like it in the sense, you know, I, I like it in as much as it requires courage to say what you're saying, because um, not, not only are you in the elevator, as you put it, but you're also the woman who walks down the street and has the cars blowing their horns, or, you know, maybe the, cl maybe the clicks unclick. Right? Or as, yeah. a, as, an in, as an invitation, right? Hey, baby, or, come on for a ride. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? And so there, there's this way in which catcalling, uh, uh, these, are, these are different sites of the interpolative, uh, forms of hailing, where then you undergo a kind of double consciousness and where they're misunderstanding who you are and where you want to lay claim to your identity by saying, I am not that. Thank you very much. 
But and the question becomes, of course, <clears throat> how does one circumnavigate that? How does one come out of that, not being a stranger to one's own self? And I think uh, one doesn't completely come out of that no. unscathed. And I, so I appreciate your 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 honesty there. Um, at some, I wouldn't mind you if you don't mind uh, emailing me, just looking me up. I'd love to to get something on transformative phenomenology. It just seems to be something that strikes me as very interesting, um, very profound. But also, I think that using the words work of Rus Irigaray, I think the question for you, for a woman, and for Black women, and I, I didn't read um, Coretta Scott King say that. Now, of course, I can't contest what she's saying. That's her experience. Um, it, it, it seems to me a little uh, counterintuitive, but I, I don't, I, I don't want to do a disservice to her experience when she talks about how she felt as a woman vis-a-vis -vis, uh, being a Black woman, but to remind those who are listening that there is a lot of work done on uh, intersectionality um, that, that shows, that deals with the epistemology of uh, Black, women's, Black women as this not simply an additive where it's woman plus Black, it is Black woman, right? Where that constitutes a unity and the experiences that come out of that are part of that unity rather than that fragmentedness. But it seems to me that we ought to be asking you the question, who art thou? Right? And, and the full quote that Arigarai gives us is, who art thou? I am, I become, thanks to this question. So there's a way of posing that question to you that suggests when I ask, who art thou? For me to pose that question, I would have to bracket out. I would have to put, so perform a kind of epoche of my own identity in terms of how I understand myself. Because for me to ask who you are means that I have to bracket out how I understand you as already sexually objectified which means that I have to fissure and suture myself and realize that who I am is predicated on who you are, who I don't know, <laughs> right? So there's a way in which the dynamism between us gets fundamentally transformed. And far more, um, I think, there's far more of this uh, existing of a kind of co-subjectivities, right? Something far more vibrant than what happens in what you've described. So thank you so very much for that. Particularly the oh, you're welcome. I, it would be wonderful to write a conversation between you on the elevator and the woman on the elevator, developing a we relationship Oof. and unpacking all these things. Oh, <laughs> that sounds like an invitation. To me. Yes, I think it would be quite interesting and enjoyable to write that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Yeah. Very good. I believe, Carlos, you had a question, did you not? Cued your microphone, Carlos. You may not have a question. Perhaps not. Okay. Are there any other questions then? If I might add just one, George was um, George was talking a bit about um, ways in which shits could get involved. I, I thought of several things as you were talking in as your talk. One of the things is uh, his whole account of the looking glass, where I interpret how the other person interprets me. And it seems to me the way you described that was what the whole elevator scene becomes very interesting because there's a mutual interpretation. You have to, you interpret how your interpretation is gonna be interpreted by this other person. It, it becomes, it, it really is very complex. And I also am reminded too, that Schutz has this whole notion of imposed relevances that really where, where I kind of go about achieving my pragmatic goals and then I encounter something. And I think that one of the key places would be something like a disability. So I'm thinking of, the, the white person, as you talked about at the end, encountering something that upsets, it's an imposed relevance that forces them to reconsider all their own uh, relevances and interests and, and typifications. It's a major revision. A lot of times those can be conceived as sort of minor little imposed relevances, like how to get around a, a corner where I, I don't have unimpeded movement. But boy, if you really begin to put it in terms of the words like metanoia and conversion that you talked about at the end of the talk, 
that strikes me as that's what really an imposed relevance would be for the white person to sit down and say, look, uh, this I've got to reformulate and understand myself and my own typifications, all my interests and relevances and values. It's, I just thought your talk was really touched into profound kind of issues in Schutzian phenomenology. Well, okay, well, that, that's, that's probably the best compliment I've gotten. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to put those, what you said in words and email me if you don't mind. <laughs> well, I'll do that, sure. Yeah, sure, absolutely. There's one, uh, I just saw another hand go up, Jerry, one last oh, hand. Great, great, I will enable, the, uh, there we go. You should be able to talk. Good. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for wonderful talk. I'm Yumi Tsuda uh, from and in Japan. Uh, I have a question about the word or language uh, problem. Uh, for example, uh, I learned the uh, expression of BIPOC these days. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, what kind of impact of uh, these uh, political correct name of black, black people or uh, political correct uh, names uh, on uh, the discriminative a situation uh, as you talked uh, how about uh, the, the political correct uh, the name uh, such as BIPOC uh, do you have any idea oh uh, uh, I, I assume that I got your your, your question if I didn't uh, just ask again um, I, I, I would want to modify how you're using the term political correct names. Um, the, the notion of being PC or politically correct, uh, and I'm not accusing you of, of, of using it in this way, but just for the record, I think it, that language is, for me is, comes off as too perfunctory. Uh, it comes off as too strategic. Um, uh, to be polit politically correct, it seems to me that it, it more is at stake, um, something far more ontologically um, vigorous uh, something far more, it seems to me to be far more, it seems to me that that, uh, that there is a, a more important legitimation practice that's happening here in terms of the affirmation of the mm -hmm. other in this case, right? Rather than something just politically correct, because there are some who will say, you know, well, oh, who cares about this political correct, correctness nonsense? Well, okay, fine, I got you, but it's not about political correctness. You are saying then to me, you don't care about getting my identity right. You don't care no. about my legitimation. You don't care about how I perceive myself. So I think the, the term BIPOC, re relatively new, for those who don't know what that is, it's B-I-P-O-C, it's, it's Black Indigenous yeah. People of Color, yeah. and it's designed uh, to be more inclusive. Um, mm. uh, of course, I think that even as we're being more inclusive, it's important that um, we don't conflate uh, the um, histories of those individuals, Black, Indigenous, people of color, because people of color is a broad category. Um, so for an example, if you're Japanese, I think that uh, we have to be careful that we don't conflate what happened between uh, 1942 and 45, where the Japanese were placed in internment camps. Horrible, vicious, in terms of what happened. Uh, it was only later in around, around 1988 under Ronald Reagan, maybe that's one thing he did that was great, uh, uh, decided to um, provide a kind of reparations for those individuals who were still alive. I think he gave them something like 20,000 a piece and the recognition of, of the horror of that internment. Um, so I think the term is, is, is much more inclusive, but again, what I would want to do, and that's why I mentioned the internment, Japanese internment camps, um, it's important that we don't uh, conflate the genealogies and it's important that we don't conflate the phenomenologies. But I think that a discussion ought to be had that will be very fruitful in terms of how the genealogies and how the phenomenologies overlap. 
And I suspect that we'd find, we'd find that perhaps at the center of that, in many cases, is whiteness as the transcendental norm. Um, Thank I you. That, I hope that answers your question. If not, push on, rephrase it. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you. And there's a question from Max Kroper. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for this uh, very fascinating and remarkable. Uh oh. Did we lose Max? I think we might have. Wait for a moment to see if he can come back. Uh, here we go. So can Max, you hear me now? Uh, yeah, Max, I'm very sorry about that. I may have inappropriately clicked. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask, um, how, how is your elevator example if you turn it the other way around? Because when you come in the elevator, then the other person already sees you and is labeling you as a black body. And I had to think about another situation I've heard about a week ago where a person was sitting in a circle of chairs and after the discussion around his neighbor stand up and went to a wheelchair. And then he realized like, oh, the other person is disabled. And then after an hour of a talk, he realized that the other is uh, sitting in a wheelchair and he started then constructing like the disabled category for the other person. Like uh, I was wondering if you also have a look on the perspective in the elevator the other way around, like if you already had an encounter via telephone or email, and then you meet the other person and the other person realizes that you are black and then starts uh, to put the white gaze on the black body. Like how is this changing the situation then? Thank you. Mm. Uh, are, are you are you suggesting that what if uh, 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 because in the scenario that I've given uh, the white woman's on the elevator she does not know me in multiple ways right the 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 the, the granular complicated ways in which she does not know me or claims that she does are you suggesting if the white woman had been primed in some way to know who I am before I got on the elevator? Like, for example, imagine if you would have a telephone call with this very woman and she doesn't know that you are the person ah. she was talking to like this. Like, she knows already that you, in brackets, like, yeah, I, I don't want to use this term, but, like, the normal, like, as a white person. Yes. And then she realized, like, oh, you're black. And then, like, yes. the whole construct she had in her mind would shake because it doesn't fit together the image she had beforehand. And now the image you may have, like seeing you in another category. Good. No, I got you. Uh, that that that's that's very good. Thank you. So yeah, ooh. So that that's a that's a nice empirical question. <laughs> it's, and because it's it's hard to it's hard to know, right? What would happen? Uh, we can we can we can think aloud though. That doesn't prevent us from thinking aloud. Um, I I think there are cases where. Uh, as whiteness is the whiteness, uh, when we talk about the white gaze, for an example, if you look at the wor work of Shannon Sullivan, she also talks about whiteness not just as ocular, uh, or where uh, where whiteness gets expressed through the ocular, but whiteness is also about what is smelled, about what is heard, right? So there's a way in which the other senses are also complicit um, with a certain kind of procrustean. Um, uh, a procrustean mode of operation so that, uh, and it's possible, let's say that I'm talking to her over the phone and from the sound of my voice, uh, it doesn't sound black, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I, I come into the office or uh, I come into the elevator and perhaps before I speak, before I register anything, there is that moment, I would argue, there is the, the white gaze operating, doing its work, always already doing its work. And then let's say I interject, oh, hi, I am George Yancey. Uh, perhaps there's a moment of pause. Perhaps there could even be a moment of doubt. 
perhaps I am not the one that I claim to be. I mean, however that would have happened, right? So, but but I, 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 what I, what I think you're asking though is really good because it suggests that, ooh, what if there's more information? What does more information do? But the, the information has been already constructed though outside of the framework of race. Because I've never, I've never told her I'm black. She doesn't know that I'm black. Um, uh, and, and my argument is that because racism, anti-black racism is so thick, it's, it's so structures our relationships, both conscious and unconscious, uh, in opaque ways, in subtle ways, um, in insidious ways. That is, I can imagine a scenario where she knows me from the phone but doesn't know this significant part about me, mm -hmm. that when she meets me, the other information gets challenged. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same uh, um, uh, salience. There's a way in which the saliency of what she knows when we talked over the phone, I'm a philosopher, uh, you know, I teach at Emory, let's say I give her all the information that doesn't indicate anything about race. There's a way in which the saliency takes a back seat to what is now frontal, right? So that perhaps that creates for her a kind of cognitive dissonance whereby the earlier self um, uh, gets named even in an, in an, an inco inchoate way as white or neutral. But once she sees me, there's the oxymoronic. There's the blatantly foolish. How could this be the person I was talking to on the phone? Right? So I think I think I think something like that could happen. And and look, racism is 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 fanciful. It is it's phantasmatic. So to to rule that out, I can't <laughs> because it sounds so right when you think about the logics of whiteness and the way in which it operates. Um, yeah, th 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 thank you for that. You know, it, it's funny. Well, not funny, but I gave a talk once, and I'll just mention, at, uh, uh, I gave a, a plenary, plenary at a Merle Ponty conference. And we were talking about the body and race and sexism at that conference. And I was the only black person who gave a talk that day. Let's say it was on a Thursday. Um, uh, the conference continued that day and continued early on Friday. I went to the hotel and I decided to sleep over and I sleep late and I came back to the, to the conference later Friday. Well, between that time, another black male had come, on to the, had come to the conference and not once, not twice, but seven times white people said to him, I enjoyed your talk the other day. Oh, that was a fascinating talk. And in each case, he said, look, I'm not the one. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, phenomenologically, I play with that and I say, well, maybe I wasn't there anyway. Right? Maybe it wasn't me. Any black body could have shown up. Here is the uh, typification and the fungibility part, right? Um, where uh, I stand in, in some sense, for any black that came. So I'm only saying that to talk about typifications in the way in which, let's say, there's a kind of understanding that the woman has but that understanding seems to be a kind of neutrality, racially. But once she sees me, there is the incongruity, if not the incommensurability. Yeah, good question. Wow, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. I did notice that Autumn Redcross uh, typed a question to us in chat, and I just wondered if, Autumn, you would like to ask it in person. Um, we. I met Autumn a couple of years ago, or almost two years ago, gave a really nice paper in Pittsburgh at SBHS, uh, and she, her, uh, a paper about the black body. And so uh, I will read her question. She messaged me and, and said that she couldn't ask it. So uh, she's her question came after Valerie Bence's question about gender. Uh, and she says, she was wondering about the last questioner and their use of the word decide in discussing gender and limits to homeness in the body. And then how do you respond to the notion of choosing race by way of the black body? Choosing race as the? By way of the black body. 
Hmm, I'm not sure what that question means exactly. Um, can we can we can we try it again so I can try it? Try. Let's hear it again. Yeah. Wondering about the last questioner and their use of the word decide in discussing gender. Yeah, the, the limits, as in decision. Yes. Uh, to homeness in the body. And then how do you respond to the notion of choosing race by way of the black body? Mm, interesting. Okay. I'll maybe say something about the latter question. Um, and just follow up. I'm fine. You know, we, we don't always get the questions uh, immediately. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, there's, I'm not sure if the, the range of, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't use the term, mm, that's, that's tricky. So there's the whole, there's a lot of literature, well, not a lot, but recent literature on transgender identities and so on, in terms of what we mean by decision. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure how to think about decision or to decide in relationship, in this case, to the black body. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure of how uh, decision, uh, which is, a, let's say, a sign of a certain kind of um, latitude for choosing uh, something um, when it comes to race, I'm not sure how that would work uh, in the way in which I think about race as uh, thoroughly heteronymous rather than autonomous, right? Where auto means self and uh, nomos means law, a law unto oneself. I mean, these racial categories, these racial identities are given to us uh, through a law of the other, right? It's the fact that we enter into an ontology, enter into a space of relevances, <laughs> um, that these things begin to make sense to us, not by way of our choice, but uh, by way, uh, ways in which, let's say, the white child says of Fainan, look a Negro, that child is becoming literate in the language and through the juxtaposition of himself uh, in terms of Fainan, uh, he is learning what it means to be white precisely through that ex exclusion. So I'm not sure if I make much of the term, I don't give much, um, uh, I don't invest much in the term decide if I understand the point in relation to, to racialization, though there, that doesn't eliminate when it comes to whiteness, something like what it would mean to undo whiteness. Although again, decide is a tricky term because I don't think anyone white person can wake up tomorrow morning and decide to become unwhite. Oh, there was, a, there, was a, there was a modifier there. I saw it in the chat. Um, was that a modifier to the question? I believe, yeah. yes, I believe that's true. Um, oh, I can, I can read it here. So I use the word decide about gender because now persons may decide, ah, change gender. However, we could study race as a decision by way of those who may decide ah to pass as white uh, and their experience or book or look like or oh, as i see all oh, right 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 where a person disguises black for you oh i see yeah uh great thank you for that um <laughs> uh yeah there there is some I, i'm gonna stay off the transgender question that, that's too that's too controversial but i will uh i will stay with the the the, the race racial identity um i got you there, there is, yes, uh, a certain kind of latitude that one uh, who is not, uh, in some sense, um, uh, phenotypically black, as it were, such that um, there is more uh, of space for a certain kind of decision. Um, but, but, but even that's tricky, because uh, at the end of the day, one is still black. Uh, we have to remember in 1662, um, uh, the, the doctrine known as um, partis sequitur ventrum, and it means uh, that which follows the belly. And white slave masters instituted this in Virginia and other uh, countries where uh, the baby uh, came through the mother and the mother was the contaminant. The mother was the individual who defined the life of the enslaved black body. Um, so, and what this conveniently, um, how this conveniently worked is that then black women could be raped by the white slave master. And no matter how phenotypically white the child was, 
the child was defined in relationship to the mother's body as if somehow the very uterus, uh, the black ma female's uterus marks the black body in a pathological way, in an enslaved way. So there's a way in which even as passing, making that decision, um, while one can do that, and while there are advantages, this is what phenotypically white or light-skinned Blacks did in order to gain greater upward mobility, uh, they uh, refused their Blackness. But yet race is so tricky is that uh, nonetheless, despite the whiteness, uh, if one, if you read Lillian Smith's uh, Killers of the Dream, uh, she talks about uh, a situation where uh, her white parents adopted a white child who they gave love to, showed love to, concern, took her in, um, and who Lillian Smith as a white woman played with. They later discovered that she was black, despite all of the phenotypic features where she was otherwise white, right? So it, 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 I mean, I, the whole idea, I guess I'm playing with the whole idea of the tragic mulat, mulata um, and the idea that even as one attempts to um, make that decision um, and uh, use it as a way of upward mobility, race um, is such a contaminant. It marks the black body so deeply. Uh, in fact, as Albert Mimi says, Albert Mimi says, we move from biology to ethics, to politics, to metaphysics, which means that even the black body that decides not to be black is black metaphysically, right? It's as if somehow it's no longer dependent upon biology. It's as if the black body has become a platonic form. So, and by the way, I, I now see who Autumn is. I know Autumn. <laughs> so thank you very much for that question, Autumn. Um, it needs to be explored in greater detail, but I appreciate it.